Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we have another story from the Shimla Village Tales, collected by Alice May Dracott. This is the story of a princess who follows her own path in life, rather than just following her father's wishes. Will she be rewarded? Listen and find out. Okay, some words used in this story. Hakim is a doctor. Mahadeo is a god. Bunia is a minor merchant. Parcheesi is a board game, better known as Ludo in the UK. And a fakir is a religious ascetic. Okay, let's begin. The Power of Fate There was once a Raja who had six daughters, none of whom were married, although all were grown up. One day he called them to him and asked each in turn whether she was satisfied with her lot in life and what fate had given to her. Five of the daughters replied, Father, our fate is in your hands. You feed us and clothe us, and all that is to be provided for our future you will provide. We are very well satisfied with our lot in life. The youngest daughter alone kept silent, and this vexed her father, who inquired why she made no reply. My fate is in no one's hands, she said, and whatever is to be will be, whether so willed by my father or not. The Raja was now angrier than before, and ordered that she should be immediately put to death. But upon second thoughts, he decided to send her to a distant forest, and leave her there without food or water, so that she might either be eaten by wild beasts at night, or else die of starvation. So she was placed in a dooley, or litter, and carried away. The dooley bearers took her to the very dense jungle, and at length arrived at a clear space, in the center of which stood a huge oak tree. Here they determined to leave her, so they tied the dooley to the boughs of the tree, where it could swing above ground, and departed. Now the princess was very religious, so she spent her time in reading, and said her prayers five times a day, believing that if it were her fate to die, she would die, but if not, some help would be sent to her. In this way, day after day passed without any relief, and the poor princess was both hungry and cold, yet she continued to pray each day until, on the morning of the ninth day, Mahadeo, who had heard her unceasing prayers, called one of his messengers and said, Someone on the earth is in great pain and sorrow, and her prayers are ever knocking at my door. Go thou to seek who it is, and bring me word. So the messenger went forth and found the poor princess in the dooley on the tree, so he quickly brought back news to Mahadeo, who sent him back with food and water to her relief. After she had eaten and drunk, She washed the brass vessels in which her food had come, and continued to pray and give thanks to God. Now each day fresh food and water was sent to her, and for her faith and goodness, Mahadeo determined to give her a reward. Looking out of her dooley one day, she noticed that the earth looked wet in a certain spot, so she dug there with her nails and found water. Not only did she find water, but stones, which were all of solid gold and silver. My fate has indeed been good, said the princess, and she forthwith determined to build herself a palace on that spot and to surround it with a beautiful garden. Next day she heard a woodman felling trees in the forest and called loudly to him. The man was afraid, for it was a lonesome spot where he had never before heard the sound of a human voice, and he thought she must be a spirit. But the princess assured him that she too was human, and a king's daughter who had been banished and promised that if he would only bring her wood to build with, and workmen to make her house, she would pay him in gold daily. Pleased at his luck, the woodman lost no time in calling carpenters and masons, and before long a lovely palace and garden were made in the once jungly spot, and here the princess with her servants lived a very happy life together. One day the king, her father, riding by that way, was greatly surprised when he saw what a beautiful house and garden had been made in the midst of the jungle. He sent his servants to inquire whose it was, and to bring word quickly concerning it. The princess saw her father's servants, and ordered that they should be treated kindly and fed on the best of food. So they returned well pleased, 
to tell the king that it was his long-lost daughter, whom he had thought was dead, that owned the palace, and she had sent a message to ask him to come and see her. The Raja was indeed surprised, and hastened to find out for himself whether or not the news were true. When the princess met him, she reminded him of what she had said about fate, and her belief that what was to be would be in spite of all efforts to prevent it, so that the Raja was also convinced that she was right. After this her sisters came to visit her, and she gave them many beautiful and costly presents. Not long afterwards the Raja made up his mind to travel, and asked each of his five children what they would like him to bring her on his return. They all wanted something different, and he had almost forgotten to ask his youngest daughter what she wanted, as she already had all that her heart could wish. But he felt so ashamed to leave her out, so he asked her also, I have all that I need, O oh my father, but if in your travels you come to a certain city where there is a little box for sale, bring it to me. The Raja soon bought his five daughters their presents, all but the little box, so when he arrived at the city his youngest daughter had mentioned, he began to inquire if there was a little box for sale. Now it was well known in that place that a certain bunya had in his safekeeping a magic box which contained a fan, and the soul of a king's son. If anyone waved the fan forwards, the prince would at once appear, but waved backwards, he would at once disappear. When the people heard a raja asking for a box, they thought that it was the magic box that he meant, so they directed him to the bunya, who said he might have it for five hundred rupees. This seemed a large sum to pay for so small, and, as it appeared to him, common a thing. Yet, rather than return without it, the Raja paid the price and returned to his own country. His five daughters were delighted with their gifts, and he sent the box to the youngest princess. She soon opened it, took out the fan, and began to wave it. No sooner had she done so, when a fine, handsome prince stood in her presence. But when she waved it in the opposite direction from herself, he disappeared. Every morning the princess summoned the prince with her fan, and during the day they spent many pleasant hours together playing Parcheesi. In the evening she sent him away. The two were always happy together and never wary of each other's presence, which, I am told, is a sign of the truest friendship. The five sisters soon came to show their youngest sister their presence, and laughed when they saw such a simple little box, asking what made her choose such a plain, common thing. Upon this the foolish girl told them the whole secret of the box, and taking out the magic fan, waved it in their presence, and the prince arrived as before. This made the five elder sisters very angry and jealous, and while they sat together playing chess, they planned mischief in their hearts. So that evening they got some glass and pounded it into little bits, and this they spread on the couch on which the prince was wont to take his midday rest. Next day when he came, the bits of glass hurt the poor prince cruelly, but being a guest he made no remark and in the evening departed to his home, where, before long, he became very ill indeed. The king, his father, summoned all the cleverest hakims, or native physicians, to his son's bedside, but they could do nothing, and day by day the poor prince lay at the point of death. In vain the princess waved her fan, but he was too ill to respond, and the five cruel sisters rejoiced to think that their plan had succeeded so well. At last the youngest princess could bear her suspense no longer. So, calling her servants together, she told them that she was going by herself to a distant country on a pilgrimage, dressed like a fakir, and no one must follow her. At first her servants would not consent. They declared they would follow her wherever she went. But after a time the princess had her way and set out on her journey. She wandered many miles that day, and at evening, weary and footsore, sat down under a tree to rest. While she sat there, an eagle and a parrot began to talk in a neighboring branch. "'What news?' began the parrot. "'Have you not heard of the magic box and the princess, and how her sisters placed broken glass on the couch of the prince, and how even now he lies at the point of death? This is indeed sad news, and is there no remedy for his illness? The remedy is simple, if they but knew it. You only have to gather the refuse from an eagle's nest, add water to it, and apply it to the hurt, 
when, after three applications, the glass will come away and the flesh will speedily heal. This conversation was eagerly listened to by the princess, and afterwards she carefully gathered the refuse beside the eagle's nest and again started with all haste on her journey. Arriving in the town, she began to cry in the streets, A Hakim! A Hakim! and was instantly summoned to the king's palace, for he had promised even to give up his kingdom to anyone who would save his son. So the princess in this disguise hastened to the king's presence, and there arranged to treat the prince on condition that no other remedy should be tried by others at the same time. At the first application of a remedy, small pieces of glass were seen to drop out. At the second, still more. And at the last, all fell out, and not one was left. This gave the prince such relief that he opened his eyes and regained consciousness, but did not recognize in the new Hakim, dressed as a fakir, his former friend, the princess. At last he got well, and he was able to leave his room, so the princess went to the Raja and begged permission to return to her own country. Return to your country when I can give you land and riches and honor here? Why need you do that? Ask me for anything, O wise Hakim, even for my throne and my kingdom, and you shall have it. I desire nothing, O king, returned the poor Hakim, but would crave of you a few tokens in remembrance of your son, a handkerchief, his sword, a ring from his finger, and a bow and arrows. These gifts are too small a return for all you have done. You shall have them, and much more if you will. But the Hakim refused, and returning to her home with the tokens she had asked for, once more resumed the dress of a princess, and taking out her fan began to wave it. Immediately the prince stood in her presence, but she feigned anger with him. All these many days I have waved my fan, and you did not come. Why have you come today, O prince? Then the prince told her of all that had happened, of her sister's cruelty, of his dangerous illness, and of the wonderful Hakim who had saved his life, and to whom he should ever be grateful. The princess was glad indeed to hear all of this from his own lips, and bringing out each gift, laid it before his astonished eyes, while she confessed that it was she herself who had tended him in his illness. The prince was overcome with joy and gratitude, and asked her to become his wife. So they were married amid great feastings and rejoicings, and they lived happily ever after. Such is the power of fate. The End Wow, I love how she kind of said she was going to do her own thing and then everything went well for her and even when her sisters tried to spoil her happiness, she was able to find a way to heal the prince and that spending time together without tiring of each other was a true test of love and friendship. Some of my closest friends I can spend hours with just being in the same room and it feels wonderful. I also like how she overheard the birds and the birds were, oh, if they only knew. It was a nice touch of the story. I also like how she wasn't beholden to her father. She was like, no, nope, I'm going to do my own thing. You can't change fate. And today's podcaster shout out goes to Archipelago Ghosts. This is a wonderful new podcast that I recently found and got into. It is the telling of stories of Indonesia. Nis and Karen tell the stories of the archipelago and explore the culture that Nis was born into and Karen fell in love with. They even use a font inspired by the Javanese script and have theme music composed on a gamelan, a traditional Indonesian instrument. And if you like it as much as I do, go and give them a five-star rating on Podchaser or iTunes. It really helps out new podcasts. And the listener shout-out goes to Jakarta, Indonesia. You are 86% of my listeners in Indonesia. Jakarta goes all the way back to the Sunda Kingdom and has been called such names as Batavia and Sunda Kalipa. The name itself comes from the Sanskrit words jaya, meaning victorious, and karta, meaning accomplished or acquired. The name Batavia comes from an ancient name for a region of the Netherlands. The flag of Indonesia is also related to the flag of the Netherlands, with the blue section removed in reference to the liberation of the nation from the colonization of the Dutch. 
The language I'm going to attempt is Javanese, so apologies for my pronunciation. Matur suwon lan sugeng dalu. Thank you and good night.